Hi, my name is Norman. Welcome to the first episode of One Day Prints. I'm usually not that guy to go fangirling about some celebrity, but in theory, if I get to spend one day with one famous person, it probably would be Adam Savage. I don't know. Uh, he seems like a generally nice guy and also, of course, he knows a lot about what he does. So this series here is about taking inspiration from his work and also honing my catting skills and of course along the way show you maybe one or two tricks how I, how, how I work and maybe it's gonna help you as well. Yeah, I don't know how far we're gonna take this. Maybe it's just gonna be one episode, maybe it's gonna be a hundred. I don't know yet. So let's get started and see how far we get. The inspiration for today's video is that spinner wheel random picker which Adam built for his friends at Sketchfest. I will link Adam's video at the end of this video so you can uh, watch it in case you haven't seen it yet. So as usual I start with a 2D sketch. Because my print bed is 18 by 18 centimeters I am drawing a circle which is 17 centimeters in diameter. And then I use the offset tool and draw two more circles with five millimeters distance from the first one. And another one with eight millimeters distance. The next important step is, well, putting in a little slot out there. I think four millimeters is gonna be fine. And then I'm creating a circular pattern using the center point as a center point. <laughs> In the other video, I think Adam is having like 68 of those pins out there. But uh, for me, because my circle is a little bit smaller, I think 45 is going to be fine. So here's a little trick for extruding sketches like these. Uh, instead of selecting each one of those subfaces individually, you can select all of them at once and then deselect the ones you do not want to have. That way you have to do a little less work. Extrude 12 millimeters. Uh, oh. Forgot one there. And then I can finally create my first component. I have created my own library of frequently used components, but basically you can also get those from GrabCAD. For a perfect placement, I'm rotating the bearing to the correct orientation and just move it aside and then use the point to point tool to move the center point of the bearing to the center point of the wheel. And with the bearing at the correct place, I can create a new sketch and project the bearing on it. Projections are a very, very powerful tool to get 3D objects mapped to a 2D sketch. <laughs> Just ignore what I'm doing here, but you can see from the purple line, uh, this is a projected object. What I'm currently drawing here is the interface of the wheel for the bearing, and I want that to be press fit. For me at least, I found that 0.1 millimeter larger radius is um, resulting in a loose press fit, which is perfectly fine for me because I want to be able to disassemble it later on. So let's fast forward the remainder of the wheel because yeah, most of it is purely aesthetics anyway. And now let's create the part where we put the bearing. <laughs> For that, I already created a sketch and you see me again <laughs> using the project function, this time projecting the inside of the bearing to be used as a reference. Theoretically, we could also use some press fit for the inside, but I don't really like uh, unpredictability. So uh, yeah, with having press fit on two sides, uh, you would never know where the bearing would be when you take off the wheel. So I have something else in mind. Because this part is going to be symmetrical, I will just design half of the part and mirror it later. In order to maximize part strength, I want to print this thing laying flat on the print bed. And to be able to pull that off, you see me just shaving off a millimeter at the top and the bottom, um, because otherwise I wouldn't be able to print the shaft. What I wanted to design is some kind of, um, well, there's probably a very smart name for this, but I don't know it. Uh, I want to split the shaft into two halves, so make it like a fork, and then add a little hole for a screw, which is just, uh, it's just gonna bite into the plastic, so no threaded insert needed here. And by screwing in the screw, it's gonna open up the tongs of the fork, so the shaft is going to uh, have a really, really tight grab onto the, the inside of the bearing. So, as usual, starting up with a sketch and drawing a center line. 
Then I'm drawing the hole for the screw. So M3 screw means 3.2 millimeters for the screw to comfortably go in. For the split in the center, I'm using a center point rectangle. I mean, it works, but uh, using a slot would have been uh, way cleaner. And how far do we split? I don't know, I'm just eyeballing it and it works. One extrusion cut for the slot and one extrusion cut with a slight taper for the screw. <laughs> as simple as that, right? There's still a lot of material here and also there are gonna be a lot of structural screws. Yeah, what you see me doing here is beefing it down a little bit so that the tongs of the fork of the shaft, uh, whatever I call it in this video here, <laughs> I'm, I'm hogging out a little bit of the material so that uh, they have you know, the ability to actually flex and move and grab the insides of the bearing. <laughs> Next up is drawing the frame, if I may call it like that. I hope you don't mind if I fast forward this in order to keep this video short. Although there are some interesting design techniques I used, um, unfortunately we have to save them for another day. I really want to show you the upper part instead, because I'm actually kind of proud how it came out. Well, at least at the end, not at the stage I'm about to show you. The upper part consists of three components, the arrow, the spring and the clicky thingy. <laughs> and this is the one which you see me designing. To attach this component to the upper bearing, I'm using a very similar technique as I did uh, with the shaft in the middle bearing. So I'm creating a small slot and this time just a three millimeter hole so that the screw will actually push out the material and press the plastic against the inner side of the bearing. And then I project a small segment of the wheel so that I have a reference and can draw the, all, you know, all the other references. <laughs> and from here on, I'm basically just freestyling my way. I don't know the exact dimensions, but I know what feels right. <laughs> Let's go that way. And I'm trying to, to make that pointy thing feel right, if that makes any sense. One thing I haven't mentioned so far is designing for 3D printing. Of course, when designing, I already have a specific orientation in mind. But what I often like to do, you can see it here, I turn the body itself uh, to the correct orientation. You can see the origin with the orange planes there in the middle. And the body, this is exactly how it's going to be printed. But of course, now it's completely wrong in the, in the Fusion model itself. So I take the component and rotate it back. And of course, also move it back to its original position. Sounds like a weird thing to do. But uh, trust me, it's going to help you later on. When you export the files, they're going to be uh, in the correct orientation for your slicer. Especially when having many design iterations, it's going to be the little things, you know. Unfortunately, the first version of the spring <laughs> didn't really work quite well. So um, I'm not going to show you too much about it, but it laid the foundation for the two attachment points of the spring. So the first one being inside the frame and the other one being inside the clicky thing which we designed in a previous step. Don't worry, we'll get back to the spring design in a minute. For now, uh, let's make an arrow. Unfortunately, there's only space for one screw here. To prevent the arrow from <laughs> spinning around, I added a little keyway uh, on the top of the click. And the arrow itself is, of course, just a circle with a pointy triangle, basically, and the keyway on the backside of the arrow. Okay guys, what is going on? You may have noticed that I'm getting more on the educational side, you know, sharing what I learned so that you can also learn and maybe also share what you learned one day. So let me introduce you to a new character I came up with. Yeah, it's the Shortcut Ninja. If you see this little guy, you're about to get hit with knowledge. <laughs> I'm thinking about literal shortcuts like computer stuff, but also maybe just like quick tips and stuff like that. So let me begin with two shortcuts which I've been using throughout the video already, but you know, you may have missed it. The first one is a shortcut for a projection while sketching. So you just press P, like project. Yeah, you can basically project anything on your 2D sketch. It's a crazily hand handy tool. I highly recommend getting into that. Also very handy while sketching is the offset tool. So you just press O for offset 
and uh, it's gonna draw like a semi-parallel line. Yeah, it's very hard to explain what it actually does. You can even draw offsets from irregular shapes like splines and all that, it's crazy. Besides the basic geometric shapes, these are actually the most used sketch tools on my side. If you aren't using them or if you're just using them without shortcuts, uh, it's really worth it getting started with those. That's all for now, so let me know what you think of our new friend and back to the video. So the spinner wheel is already looking very very nice. And at this point I'm about one and a half hours into the project. It's finally time to get those guys printed, so you see me here exporting each and every component as a mesh. So the wheel was actually my biggest concern, but luckily it fits. The only thing I changed for the wheel is increasing the infill so that we have a lot more inertia when spinning. You can tell by the very subtle red background <laughs> that uh, there are two paths outside of the perimeter, but uh, I'm just gonna ignore those because I'm pretty sure it's gonna work. And the rest of the parts, I can basically print them in default configuration. Uh, you can see here, I'm just dragging and dropping them onto the build plate and they are already in the perfect orientation. That's because of the little move I did earlier. The only thing I changed was the infill of the click um, just to give it a little bit more strength. Next up, we got the little arrow here. Uh, it's solo on the build plate because I plan on printing it in a contrasting color. The two halves of the frame are actually kind of funny. Uh, I was hoping to get them on one build plate, but didn't expect them to end up that way. But you know, it works. So nice, I guess. Reminds me a little bit of a relict of old times. Last thing to do is inspecting the overhangs here on top and uh, they seem fine, so ready to export. And then it's just a matter of uploading them to the printer and getting them printed. As I mentioned before, I don't really like the design of the first spring, so I made a new spring which is a lot springier than the first spring. <laughs> to get where we are, I'm starting from the, the original spring, and then I basically mark the parts which I don't want to keep. Then I use an extrusion cut to obliterate them from existence. That way I have start and stop of the spring at the exact same position and I won't need to modify any other existing parts or components. For the coil of the spring, you see I'm creating two new center points, one and a half centimeters, uh, millimeters distance from the center. Now I'm drawing circles alternating the center point each half turn. That means that the diameter also gets increased each half turn. If done correctly, you'll end up with a very nice coil. And after that, just a tiny little bit of cleanup and making space for the screw because it's a lot tighter than before. And then we're good to go. And while I was at the computer anyway, I thought, yeah, might as well just draw a dial and nothing special. But now we actually have something to look at when, when it's spinning. Now we can finally get to work. So uh, first thing to do is inserting the threaded brass inserts. By the way, I found out for me at least that the ideal hole diameter is 4.2 millimeter for an M3 threaded brass insert. That way you're gonna fit the bigger ones and the smaller ones, if you know what I mean. And I'll just look how satisfyingly press fitty those bearings are. Yeah, nice. That's something you're only gonna learn through experience or watching videos like these. For the frame, I'm just using M3 bolts. I didn't really plan too much about the length of the bolts. I bought one of these assorted boxes here and they, you know, it comes with all the sizes I usually need. And here you can see me tightening the tensioning bolt for the idea of the wheel bearing and then adding the rest of the frame, basically. And the dial is just glued up. Nothing really impressive here, except how much glue I actually still got out of that tube. 
I'm sorry it's kind of out of focus here, but I needed to file down the threaded brass insert a little bit so that uh, the spring actually goes nicely around the click. I actually want the spring to move freely around the bottom screw, so yeah, I'm using a drill to widen up the diameter a little bit. And then I can finally tighten the click onto the bearing using the screw screwed directly into the plastic, basically. And now let's put this thing together. Spoiler alert, it's still not gonna work. Uh, the spring is too strong still. And also uh, here is the exact moment when I realize another problem. The screw of the spring is basically binding with the spokes of the wheel. So I do not feel like waiting another 19 hours to print a 200 gram piece. So I'm using the Dremel Versa tip to cut out the parts, which I don't like. And of course, it's time to make a third version of the spring. The press pull tool is kind of unpredictable with shapes like these. So instead, I am going the old fashioned route using a sketch again, offsetting the outer part of my spiral and then, you know, extrude cutting the stuff which I don't want to keep. So this is about as thin as it gets, but I think it's still a little bit too strong. So I decreased the height as well to make it even weaker. In case you want to know, in the end, the spring is about one millimeter thick and two millimeters high. And here we are. It works really, really well. I'm kind of surprised. I really like the spring action here. One thing which I don't like is the number five. Uh, I should have gone with six because that number is a lot more usable. You could use this instead of a six sided dice and also six is divi divided by one, two and three. So you can take like, is it, is it odd? Is it even and all that? So yeah, a little bit more applicable to everyday usage. However, I'm not going to remake this with six options because these lines here in the front need to align with the teeth in the back so that we always have a definitive decision. So you cannot la land in between numbers. Yeah, in the back we have 45. So uh, to make it with six, we need like 48 or something. Remaking that is a lot of work and I don't feel like doing that at the moment. So five <laughs> is fine for now. Um, however, the main point for today was actually also practicing how to make springs. I, I think uh, the, the rotary spring, let's call it that way, is really, really cool. In case you didn't know, you can 3D print stuff like that. Now you do. I hope you learned something today. And uh, anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope also that you learned something today that would make me very happy. And that being said, see you in the next one. Bye bye. <laughs>